Hi. So at the end of the last recorded lecture, <clears throat> I got up to the girdle diagonal lemma, which we'll recap here in a moment on the board. And then we're going to proceed towards um, the final stages of proving Gödel's uh, first incompleteness theorem, which we'll probably do in the next lecture uh, after this one. <clears throat> so where were we? So the diagonal lemma here, <clears throat> uh, this is about what you can do in axiom systems that extend number theory. And for number theory, we take as our finite set of axioms, the set Q, right? For an earlier example in chapter two, it's got seven axioms, but it's actually quite a powerful theory, relatively speaking. Um, the main point about Q is that you can represent or define, if you like, any recursive function in it. So any of the basic facts about recursive functions are provable in Q. So it's a very useful base theory from which to put your theorems. So what we're going to do is take any <laughs> set of axioms in the language for the natural numbers, so Q here, but actually can be in a larger language. Right? And as long as this diag function, <clears throat> this was the function you recall that you you plug in a number and if it's the girdle number of a formula, the function will spit out the girdle number of the diagonalization of the formula. And that's an algorithmic process and so a recursive function. So as long as the theory is strong enough to prove basic facts about this particular recursive function, then <clears throat> the theorem said you could take any formula psi and you can find a sentence, <clears throat> chi, such that we can prove in the theory that chi is equivalent to psi with the code number, the Gödel number of chi replacing y in the formula. So chi is equivalent to psi of corners here, code number, Gödel number of chi. And this we proved, and I said there are two versions in the note. This is kind of informal and then a slightly stricter, more formal version. You don't need to worry about the more formal version. The informal version is fine. Mm -hmm. Is about <laughs> a generalization of the idea of a theory being finitely axiomatizable. Is we can talk about theories being axiomatizable by an algorithm. So such a theory <clears throat> may have infinitely many more axioms, but those axioms can be given to us in an algorithmic way. So theory T is recursively axiomatizable. If there's a recursive set, such that T and T0 have the same consequences. So the set of sigma such that T proves sigma is the same as the set of sigma such that T0 proves sigma. So T0 does just as good a job as T as proving things. But the point is that this T is a nice recursive set given to us by a, um, an algorithm. So it's a generalization of the idea of being finitely axiomatizable. Perhaps T could be replaced by a finite set T, but we allow here infinitely many axioms as long as we can recognize an axiom, as long as they're given to us in an algorithmic way. So an example is that we've seen of things that are infinitely axiomatizable, torsion-free um, torsion groups, 
we wrote down an infinite set of axioms for those. But actually, if you thought about it, you could write down a program to give you the codes for those axioms. So the torsion-free groups are recursively axiomatizable. Okay, so these are recursively axiomatizable. You could go back and look at those axioms and just think about how you would write a computer program to produce their code numbers. Any finite set is recursive. Q is itself. I no need to find another Q zero. Q has only got seven axioms. So it's trivially recursively axiomatizable as it's finite. I can write a computer program that can just write out those seven axioms. It's kind of trivial. Okay, and any questions about that? Proposition 640. Well, let me let me say some, <coughs> I mean, let me make some other recapitulations, right, before we do this. So, I mean, the idea is, <coughs> I mean, the following function is, this is a function f, and what it does is look at proofs. A proof in T, otherwise. <clears throat> Look at this function. Let's think about this function. We saw how we could use primes to code up proofs using axioms from T and also using our two rules of inference. <clears throat> so this function here, we would say is an algorithmic or computable function if given x, we look at the number x and we just check whether it's a code of sequence of properly formed formulae and we can check whether it's a proof. The only thing that's novel here is we have not just pure predicate calculus, we have to perhaps check for these axioms. But if I've got an algorithm to check for the axioms, I can combine that with the algorithm for proof checking. And then I can verify whether X is a correct proof in this recursively given set T. So this is the advantage of recursively axiomatizable theories is the sum T zero, for which I've got an algorithm for here checking. So now I can check whether numbers code proofs in the system T or T0. So that would make this here a recursive function, an algorithm, this kind of recursive characteristic function, if provided that this check for axioms of T is a recursive process. So again, my slogan that I'm using recursive to mean the same as algorithmic or computable. So this is a recursive function. Provided that T is itself a recursive set. In other words, being a recursive set means that its characteristic function for the code numbers of things in T is a recursive function. So 
So a set of Gödel numbers for x, for x in t, is recursive. Okay. So if t is given to me by an algorithm, this is an algorithmic function. So is this then. So this is one, zero. If x codes a proof in t of the formula with girdle, girdle number y. And zero otherwise. So this is just a variant on the one above here. Here there are two inputs, x and y. What does the algorithm do? It first checks whether this function is a one. And so it checks that x codes a proof. And then it just looks at the last line on the proof and sees whether that's coded with y or not. So then it can output one or zero. So again, this is a recursive or algorithmic function. Okay. <clears throat> now again, <clears throat> as I said, this is like checking proofs. It's not providing proofs. <clears throat> it's just, it's, it's limited in some sense. I mean, we put in code numbers, we decode things from X and we check whether it's a proof or not. This is entirely different from saying Here's y, which is a code of some sigma. Is there a proof of y or is there a proof of not y? So that's a different question. And in general is, is um, more difficult. A computer can answer whether something is a genuine proof or not, but it can't provide proofs. It can't say, you can't input some statement in number theory to a computer and the computer will halt with a one or zero if that statement is provable from the axioms or not. That's a different procedure. In fact, we'll see there is no such algorithm that will do that. That's what mathematicians are for. But what 640 has is here it says, that there is a way of generating theorems deducible from T, right? There is a procedure that you can just leave running and what it will do is just keep printing out theorems. So let's see how this works. So we start with an act, we've got an ax, sorry, a recursively axiomatizable theory. So you could take perhaps T as a recursive set itself, or for an example, you could think of Q, right? Then there's an algorithm for generating theorems deducible from T. So 
So there's a computable program. that outputs girdle numbers or sentences sigma so that t proves sigma. So we just we just argue informally, right? So we're told T is recursively axiomatizable. So there's a computable procedure Okay, P It defines a T zero, which has got the same consequences as T. So for all intents and purposes, we're talking about this T zero. So from the discussion that we've just had, I can tell whether number n is a code number of a correct proof in T0. So a way of generating girdle numbers of theorems from sigma is just to test each of the numbers in turn. I test whether zero codes are proof, one codes are proof, two codes are proof, and so on. And each time it does code a proof, I print out the last line of the proof, the theorem that it proves. So this generates the theorems. So essentially what we're just doing is saying the following. So we just implement the following. So we just check if n is the code of a proof in T of some sigma. So what we're doing is just checking F of proof of T of N equals one or zero using the functions I talked about on the previous page. So IE. We just check whether this is the case. If so, we output sigma, right? If not, we just say go to B. So what do we do at B? We now just set N to be N plus one. Increase N by one, and then we just go back to A. Okay, so we just continually keep running this program here for increasing numbers of n's. And for those where the answer is one, we output the sigma that is so proven. So this algorithm will generate theorems. But of course, if something is not a theorem, it's not going to say ever that it's not on the list. We'd have to wait forever. So it's like a, a positive thing. It'll tell us when something is a theorem, right? And it'll produce, keep producing theorems, but it's not producing a list of things that are not theorems. But there's one case where that does happen. This is lemma 641. 
So let me again remark on the important remark in the notes. Okay, so this does not say that there's a procedure, okay, P bar, so that P bar will output one. So if on input, say, girdle number of sigma, if um, T proves sigma, And it output zero otherwise. Okay, we're not saying that, right, here. Indeed, there is no such procedure. But there is a situation where there is a procedure, and that's when the theory is complete. Does that say go to, someone asks? Yes, this is kind of like computer speak, go to B, and this is go to A. I don't know why I put these lines through that, making it zeros. So lemma So if S here, this set of sentences is complete, these are the things that we can prove from T. And T has to be both consistent and recursively axiomatizable. then S is recursive. So again, being recursive means there's a computable procedure which will give me a one zero answer as to whether something is in S or not. So that's giving me a one zero answer as to whether it's provable from T. So the key here is to add completeness. Right? Could I go back to the page before? All right. So I'll read this out, remark. So again, this is just a remark on bottom of page 101. This does not say that there's a procedure P bar. It says the P bar will output one if on input girdle number of sigma, if sigma is provable from T and it outputs zero otherwise. So, I mean, it's sorry, it's not very, If, so let's say, yeah. so P bar of girdle number of sigma 
is one or zero <coughs> if T proves sigma, if not. So we're saying there's no such P bar like this in general. But now in the next lemma, we'll show a situation where there is a P bar. But that's because we add on special conditions to T. And the special condition is that the, the T is complete. The set of its consequences is complete. So recall, for something to be complete, it means for any formula, either sigma or not sigma is in there. For every sigma, either sigma or not sigma is in S. Because T is consistent, we don't have both. Right, so an inconsistent theory is trivially incomplete because it proves everything. That's not the situation here. We ask that T be consistent and it be algorithmically given right here. And then the set of consequences is a decidable or recursive set here. And it's a variation of the argument that we've just really just given. Right? we show that S is effectively decidable. Meaning there's an algorithm for telling us whether something is in S or not. So, By the last lemma, let R be the procedure that on input N, outputs the girdle number of the proof in T0, which encodes. And T0 is the recursive set that has the same consequences as T. maximizes T. Um, <clears throat> so it outputs the girdle number of the last line of the proof, sorry.
So we should insert that here. Uh, so, what are you doing? I'm just shutting my eyes for minutes. No! Somebody's got their microphone on. I'm hearing too much private conversation. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, we're saying that we've got a program that will always output the girdle number of the last line of the proof, which the input codes, if indeed it does go to proof. And it'll output zero otherwise. If in Do not code such a proof in T0, then it outputs zero. Now we use the completeness of S. Either sigma or not sigma is in S. Right? So now to know whether a theory T proves sigma, I just run the algorithm from the last lemma and I just wait. Right? Now I'm guaranteed because it's complete that either sigma or not sigma is provable. So there will be some N I don't know which it is, whether it'll prove sigma or not sigma, but I can just wait and see. I know that there is some n that'll code a proof which will decide whether t proves sigma or t proves not sigma. So I'm just patient and I wait until I reach that n and then I see what the output is. So then I'll know whether it's sigma or not sigma that's in S. So as S is complete, for any sentence sigma, either T proves sigma or T proves not sigma, i.e., well, it's the same, the same thing. Either sigma's in S, or not sigmas in S. So as we run the procedure R, after a finite number of steps, we'll have discovered which one of these it is. We don't know how many steps it takes. We can't predict in advance how many steps it'll take, how long that proof may be, right? But we do know that sooner or later there'll be a proof of sigma or not sigma. So for some undetermined number of steps, So I will output either the girdle number of sigma or of not sigma. Yeah. But again, as the machine continues to run, as T is consistent, we won't get both.
as t is consistent. So, so essentially, right, the algorithm here is just the algorithm of 640. But whereas in 640, we just let the program keep running and keep, keep printing out as outputs girdle numbers of sentences, right? Here, we're guaranteed, if we're looking for a particular sigma, we'll get an answer because we'll see sigma or not sigma eventually, and then we can halt. So the algorithm is essentially that of the last lemma. So if we're searching for particular sigma or non-sigma, particular sigma, to see if t proves sigma or t proves non-sigma, then it will halt. This is the difference. So QED there. So the slogan is, so the maxim, the slogan is, With the completeness of S or of T, I mean, we say also T is complete if the set of its consequences is complete in this way. So the completeness of T. And assuming T is recursively axiomatizable. We indeed have a, a test for theorem hood in T. Sorry, Philip, is it the completeness of S or T? Um, they're the same thing, actually. Um, I think I should just have said, I should perhaps, I mean, we say a theory is T, and we say a theory is complete, a theory T is complete, if the set of its consequences either has, for every sigma, either it or its, complement, or its negation in there. Um, I suppose what I really should, perhaps I really should, I uh, should be consistent with what I said before and say, if T is complete. Um, so let me say, say this here. So T is complete theory. And and we let S here be a set of consequences. So that's it. And then this here we say T being complete means for every sigma either it or its negation is a consequence here. Sorry, so I was just, so when I say S is complete, we can say T is complete. 
I mean, if one thinks about it, it doesn't make a difference, but it's, I should stick to what I originally, um, my original nomenclature. That's brilliant, thank you. Right, so let's, let's say that we change that in the notes. I mean, if you think about it, if T is a complete theory, then this, then S is also a complete theory. Right? I mean, theory is just a set of sentences. Right? This is a complete theory because, you know, because T is complete, every sigma or not sigma, either or, but not both is in S. Right? So when we look at the consequences from sigma again, either sigma or not sigma is in there. So if T is complete, S is complete. Let's cross out this bit. So now I just make S the set of consequences of, of T. But now, so S is a set of theorems that we can prove from T. But what we're showing is that theoremhood from T is algorithmic. There's a, an effective procedure and so recursive function. There's a tell us whether a particular girdle number is something provable from T or not. And this is what we don't have without this assumption that T is complete. So does it output sigma, not sigma or zero, which is sigma or not zero. Um, so I'm thinking of my algorithm R as a program. It inputs a number N and if N codes a proof from the axioms T zero, which axiomatize T, then it's gonna output the girdle number of the proof. Girdle number, sorry, of the last line of the proof here. So, so let's see, let's try make it look a bit more mathematical. So R of N, what it's gonna do is output a girdle number of sigma. If N codes a proof in T zero with last line sigma. So it codes a proof of sigma and output zero otherwise. That's what my algorithm is doing. Right? So I can think of the, the procedure as kind of producing, You know, as n varies, it's going to be producing, well, either girdle numbers of theorems or zeros if the n doesn't code anything. Right? So as I increase n, right, right, I could then keep looking then to see what else is provable. Right? But the thing is, because t0 and t is complete, any sigma or its negation will be provable from T zero. So for some N, this procedure will output either the girdle number of sigma or of not sigma, if it's not sigma that's on the last line of the proof. Right? But I know it's gonna be either or, it's one of these two that T zero will eventually prove. It won't prove both because T zero is consistent. So as I increase n, I will eventually find right, a proof of either sigma or not sigma, and it will then output that there. Okay, I hope that's... Um...
Okay, so I hope that's uh, um, that's clearer. Is that all right? Okay, that'll be that'll be fine. It'll be enough for today. I think we'll leave the incompleteness theorem itself for tomorrow. Um, so, are there any questions about this? Right, good to get this straight. <laughs>